today. Father, I pray for salvation today. Father God, if there's somebody in this room that's never came and never had an encounter with Jesus, I pray, oh God, today that that would be the focal point of why we're even unlocking the doors today. Father, I bless you. I honor you. And we ask you, God, even right now to continue to bless these in need. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. I'm going to let Brother Sparks come and, and do what Brother Sparks does. All righty. Come on. Well, good morning. Cold morning. <laughs> At least it, it, the thermometer said it was anyhow. Oh, but it's good to be back in the house of the Lord today, and it's good to be here as well as we are. You know, when we get our age, you get, you get up every morning, and you just thank God that you're able to stand on your feet. <laughs> And put faith and trust in God today that everything is going to go according to His will and His purpose and His plan. Amen. What we're studying about today? What does the word transformation mean to you? Huh? Changed. Changed. That don't mean like taking off dirty clothes and putting clean clothes on and going about your business. That means when you get your clothes off, take a good old soapy shower. <laughs> Got to go deeper than just the skin. Got to go to the heart. And that's exactly what the scriptures is uh, telling us today. <laughs> We're pre uh, teaching from Ephesians again and Ephesians is broken down, it's six, six chapters, it was one letter, but six chapters broken down when they wrote the Bible, and the first three of them is due to uh, the uh, practical nature of, of living, and the other one is to the tr uh, spiritual nature of living, the, the, the last three, which that's the ones that we're involved in today, and that is the last three chapters of the book of Ephesians that's written by Paul. Transformation is a word that does mean changing. And it's, it's a lot of way to change in life. We change as we grow older. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always heard, and this is, of course, this is old people saying, that your body changes every seven years. Now, I know mine's changed some. I remember growing up, you couldn't get me to drink a glass of tea. I'd drink me water. I didn't like that stuff. But I love tea now. <laughs> and there's a lot of other things that I didn't like that I, that I used to. I wouldn't eat. But I do now. But they, that is a way that the body changes. And we, don't, we don't realize it changes like that. But it does. As we grow older. Most of us think about all the, when we grow older, the only thing that we really pay a note, attention too much is the physical change. <laughs> it's, everything gets harder for us, seem like, to do. But we know today that uh, we're going to be able to go as long as the Lord intends for us to go. We're going to be here as long as the Lord intends for us to be here. But we know that there will come a time when things will be different. So the lesson that we're getting into today is taken from Ephesians beginning in what the uh, fourth chapter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there's a couple of things here that it brings to mind. I'm going to kind of read over it and let you get a feeling of it first of all here. The term lifestyle was first used in 1946 to signify the typical way of life for the public. That's what there's the terminology that the people used to when they were talking about the people of this country. That was their, their way of getting it across to people, lifestyle. But he goes on to say here, uh, until 1980 did this term uh, come about in that, in that era of time. New, new lifestyle. And when I thought about that, I said, be again. New old lifestyle and new lifestyle. And that's what the Bible teaches us said, that when we become a new person in Christ, what happens? 
all things pass away. There's another word there that's more important than that, though. What is it? A L L. All things, not part of them, not some of them, but all things become new. That means from the top of our head to the soles of our feet, our heart, our attitude, our character, our way of life, all of it makes a change. That is, if you get a good old dose of salvation by, from God and look at the Spirit of God in your heart and you let Him begin to live where Satan used to live. But you ha that's the way that it has to go. And that brings about a new lifestyle for us. We don't want to go to the places we used to go. don't want to do the things we used to do. But whenever we take on the life of Christ, they become a new order of desires, if you would, in our life. We, 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 we change from a menu of selfish and personal feelings to a biblical and spiritual feeling. And we hunger for the things that are spiritually inspired, not the things that are physically permanent for us. Because those things that are physical will take you places you don't want to go. And it'll cause you to do things you don't want to do. So we are, not only the, the things that we have used to do change, but the attitude or desire and the will of us has to also change. Take on, become, well, we, we become a new person in Christ. Behold, old things pass away and all things become new. That's not hard to understand. What's the matter with the world today that they don't understand that? Well, we know today that we're living in a time that <laughs> God is more hated than he is loved. If you notice... If you're watching TV and you notice TV, whenever most of the people now that at, at these big sporting events and all, that when they pray, how do they close their prayer? The Bible tells us that if we ask anything of God, uh, from God in the name of Jesus, huh? In the name of Jesus. That's the... You used to hear that at the closing of most all prayers that were offered. Now then, they won't even let a minister use the word Jesus. If he does, he don't get to pray. Now, what do you think? How do you think that that would, would register with God? People's hearts are, as Isaiah teaches us in uh, the book of Isaiah... <laughs> And um, I'll get over here and read it. He said, wherefore? And by the way, this is 29th chapter of Isaiah and the 13th verse. Wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart. The Bible teaches us from the abundance of the heart, the mouth so speaketh. So that pretty much clarifies what is going on, doesn't it? They honor me with their lips, and, but they have removed their hearts far from me. And their fear towards me is taught by the precept of men, if it's taught at all. It's man's way, not God's way. But we know that that's not exactly the way that God intended for it to be or has said that it must be. But that's the way that they, that people, the trend that people are going in. They don't seek God no more. They don't pray no more. How many, I, well, I, I won't do that. I started asking how many of y'all had a little cell phone conversation this morning. I 
Hey, I don't have one. I have a cell phone, but it's one of them little bitty things. It'll ring, I'll answer it. And when I make a telephone call, I punch in a number and I get who I call for. Other than that, that thing don't mean a thing in the world to me. Yeah. Yeah. But just stop and think. If we as Christians would devote one-tenth of the time to God in our life each day that we do on a telephone. It'd be easier to live a Christian life. Yeah. yeah. Which do you think is the easiest? To be saved or to live a sanctified Christian life? Huh? A lot of people have declared or come to the altar, prayed, and, and have testified that they're saved. And most of the nominal church, if you ask them if they're Christian, oh yeah, Christian, I was saved so and so and so and so. But what kind of life do they live? Huh? Does their life exemplify or typify the life of a Christian? Or do they live just like the world lives and they lived all their life? Did their lifestyle change? Did their vocabulary change? Did their desires change? If it didn't, something's wrong. Either the Bible's wrong or they're wrong. And I don't think the Bible is wrong. Do you? The Bible tells us in no uncertain terms. And this is back in Isaiah. People say, oh, I, I read that in the New Testament. But what did Isaiah tell us here in uh, the uh, 55th chapter of being? And, and beginning with the uh, sixth verse. Now, this, this is Isaiah the prophet. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him. Yeah. You know, and I guess I'm as guilty as most people. How many of you remember when, well, let's say 50 years ago, and I've been in the church quite a bit longer than that. Fact of the matter, I was looking at a book this last week, and I opened it up, and it said a gift from Reverend Bill Harper to Bobby Sparks, 1953. So, I've been in, I've been in it for a while. But when, what, you know what intrigued me more about the, the Church of God than anything? And I, and I was raised up in a primitive Baptist church, too, by the way. They shouted. They washed feet. You remember, they used to have the foot washing. They had July the 4th, they had a whole social, what they call an association. It was a whole week of preaching and washing feet, yeah, of church. Yeah. And when they went to church in the morning, they got home in time to milk the cows, and that's about it. Because there'd be three and four and five preachers that would preach during the day. And they didn't preach no 15 or 20 minute sermon, honey. Uh-uh. And not only that, but another thing. When I got into the church of God, the first time I ever went into it, I thought, I'll admit it, I didn't know what was going to happen. I wondered if I was going to get out alive, really. People shouting and throwing their hands and and praising God and, well, running up and down the aisle. And when it come time to pray, I was used to a nominal church. They called on brother so-and-so to pray. He stood up and prayed. Everybody else sat there real quiet. Boy, that didn't happen then. When they said, let's pray, everybody hit the floor on their feet, and everybody began to raise their hand and pray out loud. They called on God. Yeah. What do we do now? Call on God. What does the word call mean? 
If you our dog got lost and, and you, was, you, you was looking for him, and would you go outdoors and say, Hey, Fido, Fido, hey, Fido, come on, Fido, where you at? Yo, no, 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 no. You'd be hard. Hey, Fido, where are you at? Hey, Fido, get yourself here. Hey, Fido, come home. What's happened to us? Huh? You know, the word whisper, as far as I can tell, is only listed twice in the Bible, and it's not a good term used in. But the Bible tells us to call upon God verbally. Yeah. Open your mouth. But he said, let the wicked forsake his ways. Now, by the way, what we're studying about here is the practice, is a spiritual rather, matterism of life, the new life, new lifestyle. And so in order to live a new lifestyle, we have to know what the Bible tells us to do and what we have learned from experiences with God. That experiences will stick to we a, whole, a lot longer than good experiences. You know that? You learn from bad experiences. That's, that's what, when I was growing up, man, and something happened, and, and my dad said, how'd you do that? I mean, tell me, say, oh, well, you'll know better next time, won't you? You learn from experience. And experience, my wife's dad, he always said, well, experience costs you more, but it's the best teacher because you don't forget too easy. I think we forgot our experience with God. I wonder sometimes what would actually happen if we had one service where that the Spirit of God came down and slayed people like it did back in the 50s and 60s. Slayed them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you something, friend. When the Spirit of the Holy Ghost gets a hold of you, like, just like God wants to get a hold of you, you ain't going to know you in this world. You ain't going to know what you're doing. You ain't going to know. Well, all you can do is believe what people tell you to happen. I've been there. I've done that. And it's still good today. Well, Lord, I... He still lives today. But you know what? There's something that God has required us to do, it, and we quit doing it. He said in Matthew's Gospel 6, chapter, he said, when you pray, pray in this manner. When you, enter, when you pray, enter in into your closet and shut the door and pray. You know why God said do that? There's some things that you don't have no business knowing. You don't need to know. I don't need to know what all your problems are and don't want to know. If you ask for me to pray for you, I'll pray for you. But I ain't going to have to have your high life history. And God doesn't expect us to reveal our life history because he's the one that we're going to talk to and he's the one that we're going to depend on to perform the work that's got to be done or the whatever that needs to occur. And all we need is, is your support. Yeah. You believe with them? Yeah. You pray for them. And let God do the work. But he said, let the wicked forsake his ways. Now this, this is what hap was happening before these uh, Gentiles were converted into Christianity. Because uh, the church of Ephesus here was made up of saved Gentiles. Not Jews. The Jews, very few of them was ever saved. And, I, and all they'd done was give the Gentiles a hard time. Because they would not, would not conform to the Jewish teaching, you know, of circumcision and this and that and the other. And especially the law of Moses. That's what they live by. But Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I, I came to fulfill the law. That's it. 
And he, when Jesus did what he did as far as the law was concerned, uh, he, he put on the bottom of it, the end. We have the Ten Commandments. Yeah, but they are, that, that's different from the law of Moses. Moses' laws was, that was, was dictated by God through men, and men emphasis, put the emphasis on the law. But whenever we abide in God's favor and let God do the work in our life, God will do the putting the emphasis on it. And that whatever his will is and whatever des, where our desires is to be accomplished, will be accomplished. But he said... Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. Do you say? There's one word there that, that you need to catch. I don't know whether you did or not. Who was God talking to here? Huh? Who was Isaiah talking to here? You didn't catch it, did you? <laughs> the unrighteous man his thoughts, and had him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to the, our God, he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. <laughs> See, <laughs> A lot of people don't want to entertain God's thoughts. God's thoughts and God's inspired word will control our thoughts. It's one thing that I, I, when I was going to, uh, in grammar school, uh, they, we, well, most of you had too. It was literature. Had a big old book about that thick and had, had sat there and everybody would read so much and then they'd have to, well, uh, a lot of time, in a lot of cases, uh, you'd go to the library and get a library book. You're supposed to read it, and when you got through reading it, what'd you do? Uh, you had to give a book report. You know why they done that? The teachers done that, huh? So they know you had read the book. If you know you're going to have to tell a story about something and you don't know any of the fundamentals of it, you're going to sit down and read that thing and find out what it says, ain't you? So you will know that whenever you're called on to get up and make the report that you will have all of your facts and figures where they need to be. No different with God's Word. Heaven and earth will pass away. But God's word is not going to pass away in every way. Yeah. But, you see, <laughs> Apostle Paul here, he said, that I say therefore, testifying unto the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles. Walk in the vanity, and that walk in the vanity of their hearts. You see, I've had open heart surgery by man, but I also had my first surgery by God. Heart surgery, that is. That old heart was changed. Yeah. We often do things that we allow our thoughts. And by the way, that brings up what I was fixing to tell you a while ago. I read it in, in one of our literature books. It said, never let your thoughts become your aim. I never forgot that. Because I said, well, you know, that makes good sense. Because a lot of times I sit and think about what I'd like to do, and I say, uh-oh, I know if I do, I know what's going to happen when I get caught. The right hand of fellowship when my dad gave it to you, you didn't forget it. You, wouldn't, you would live with it the rest of your life. Now, my mother, she was one that had, she, she at least had some, some sympathy because, uh, you know, a mother's love for a kid is, not, is much stronger than a father's kid. Father is to the kid. Yeah. My dad was one of those, when he, when he started whipping you, it was like he was fighting a, 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 in a ring with some other opponent. 
I, I, the, the last time that I remember that my dad gave me what he called a real good thrashing was that the, he, he didn't stop because he wanted to, but we lived next door to a policeman, and he happened to be out in his backyard, and he walked down to the house, and he grabbed my dad by the arm and pushed him back and told him, said, if you hit him one more time, I'm going to put you in jail for abuse. That's right. I'm not kidding you. That's the truth. I ever told it. God be my witness. Yeah. That's the kind of, that's kind of thrashing that we got growing up. So when, when Dad said, I'm going to give you a whooping, he didn't say when. A lot of times he'd wait till you went to bed. Yeah. And pull the cover back and lay it on you. Yeah. You see, I, I, I was brought up hard and tough. <laughs> but I don't regret it. I don't regret it at all. I, I have uh, lived a life, and I, I've only, one, only, only twice I've ever seen a jail cell inside, and, and I went there as a Gideon then to talk to the people and give them Bibles. <laughs> so I, I, I've, I've been very fortunate and had, had a good life. But anyhow, going on <laughs> there. <clears throat> Peter is one that also made a lot of comment in regards to the life that we must live. And what happens? Well, he tells us here, about, and I'm going to read to you in the sixth chapter here in verse uh, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and what? Be ye separate. That used to produce messages that we used to hear preached a long time ago that's called a message of sanctification. The Bible speaks a lot about sanctification. Sanctification is a, if you translate that word, uh, translate that word it means, sanctified means purified, cleaned up, cleaned up. Washed up. And don't diddle out in the world. You know, a lot of people have religion, but they don't go, it's not skin deep. It, they, they didn't have a change of heart, and they didn't have a change of life. They've lived the same old life. They're just like a clown putting on a suit and performing. And that's all they do, perform. But that won't get you to heaven. That won't get you through the door. So, let me find, find, let me find what I'm looking for here. <laughs> that for this cause was the gospel preached. This is Peter 4 and 6. For this cause was the gospel preached and also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but living according to God in the spirit. Then you go over here to uh, there 17. Said, listen, and that this is where the rubber really meets the road. We're studying about church people today. We're not studying about the world. We're studying about ourselves. For Peter tells us in verse 17 of the fourth chapter, for the time is come that judgment must begin where? Huh? In the house of God. Now you know why that when you read Revelations that Jesus began to tell us in the second, third chapter of Revelations about the seven churches of Asia Minor? Yeah. He wasn't talking about the world. He's talking about the church. Yeah. You know what he talked to? You know what his problem was with the Ephesian church? And you've heard Brother uh, 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 Scott telling all about it. But you know what happened to them? Same thing has happened to the church world today. You have. But here it is. 
Time is coming. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, with us Christians, supposed to, be, supposed to be, what shall the end be to them that obey not the gospel of God? That's not a hard answer, is it? The Bible said you're going to die and you're going to be judged. You're going to go to hell. And you're going to burn in fire for eternity. For the wire, fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. But he get on and he said, and if the righteous, this is what gets you scared. If the righteous scarcely, what's that word scarcely mean? Just a few. What does the Bible tell us about what's going to happen in the last days? Except there's a great falling away. Well, you talk, I talk to a lot of different people or have in the past going running a business that I've run and there wasn't nothing to help most of us that know each other well. We just talk about churches. And they'd ask, say, well, how's your church doing? We're fine. Well, get along like usual. But if the righteous scarcely be saved, he said, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? In other words, I say put it like this. You know what a balance set is? It's a weighing or way measuring type of machine. It sits on a pedestal. It has two plates. And as long as they're empty, the crossbar is perfectly level. But whenever you put a weight, it can be a penny, it don't matter. That crossbar don't stay level. It begins to drop on the side with the weight. What are we weighted down with? What is our load that we bear? Huh? Hey, what well, hindered the old man? You did run well. What's been your, what is your problem now? What is the world's problem now? They love the world because they lost the love of God. Anybody that says that they love God more than they love the world and can't get to church but at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, I say they better be praying. Amen. Amen. You know, the Bible tells I, I, I've heard all my life, and I'm a soul solid believer of it. Action speaks a lot louder than your words do. Don't tell me, show me. Amen. And that's exactly what God expects out of all of us. It's not what you say, it's what you do. Because if your heart is right, you're going to say the right thing. You don't have to worry too much about that. Because the Bible said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Mm. Wherefore, let them that suffer accordingly to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him. In well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. You know, I thought I wondered. <clears throat> when God created Adam and Eve and put them in the garden, they were perfect. I used to tell, tell everybody, and, and I believed it myself until I, I got real serious and started reading the Bible and studying it, not just reading it. That there had never been nobody in this world but since Adam and Eve that was perfect but God. But that's not what the Bible said. Read Job. The Bible said Job was a perfect man. Now, I, I can't make that any plainer or I can't darken it out any. That's what God said. And God is the judge. That Job was a perfect man as far as God was concerned. Not the world, not, just, not, not Job's friends. <laughs> Job's friends is like the world friends today. They accused him of everything in the book, trying to figure out, what in the world is this problem, Joe? Why in the world are you suffering the way you suffer? God tells us that many are the afflictions of the righteous. Did you know that? Just because you're a Christian don't mean you ain't going to never have a sick problem. God says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but my God shall deliver us out of them all. Hey, you know what? A lot of people don't realize one thing. You might have that problem for the last 10 years or some of your life or all your life. 
Some are born like that. But there will come a time when God calls them home. That old diseased, sick body is going to go back to the dust of the earth where it came from, and the soul is going to take its flight back to God who gave it, according to Ecclesiastes. Yeah, it's just that simple. Yeah, my brother that just passed away felt so sorry, I think. To me, uh, the cancer like he had is the cruelest death about it that a person can die. He, 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 he always told me every time I was there, he says, you, you know, I've served God for many years and, and I'm ready to go. I don't have a thing in the world to be worried about. I'm ready to die. I wish he'd take me out of this old sick body. But he didn't. He went from over 150 pounds down to less than 100. Skin and bones. Yeah. To me, that's a, that's, that's a cruel death. But why did he have to suffer? I don't know what God's plan or purpose was. I don't know what God's plan or purpose is for my life. Neither do you. That's a part that God only knows himself. God only knows the number of days that we're going to be on this earth. But he said it's appointed on a man wants to die. That we can all count on. You can put that in the bank. It's appointed on a man wants to die. And that's not the bad part. My brother was glad to die. And I was happy for him. And I prayed to God, deliver him out of that sick body. When I had to go to see him, and he was so sick, he couldn't even talk, hold up his head. Yeah. And pray with him. And he'd say, God, help me. God, take me on. Yeah, that was his prayer. And everybody said, well, I'm sorry you lost your brother. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that he had to die. But I thank God that he did something that I prayed him to do, and that was deliver him out of that old sick body Amen. that tormented him day and night. And that may be the only way that we'll be delivered, but we will be delivered because this old body is not going to go nowhere from this earth, from dust we came and thus we shall return. Naked we came into this world, and naked we're going to leave it. Woo, glory! Don't care what you've got. Don't care how rich you are, how big your bank account is. <laughs> Don't have a thing to do with God, except you better have obeyed the Word of God. I count my success not being because, well, you're looking at it as far as I made in school was eighth grade when I was, went to the first grade in high school and, and I liked all my subjects except English and I'll tell you what's the honest truth I thought that was the stupidest mess that I'd ever tried to learn in my life I just quit I quit I went to work when 16 years old yeah I'm, and up until, up until this year, I worked pretty good steady, steady all the time. Yeah. But I, I give God the credit. God's the one keeps me on my feet. God's the one that wakes me up every morning. You know why? The last thing I do of a night is thank God for the day that I've had. Good, bad, or indifferent. Ain't no day bad. Well, if it's bad, we made it bad. God didn't make it bad. I pray God help us through the day. God deliver us from our adversary. God give us grace to overcome. God give us grace to, to walk the walk, talk the talk, and live the life. Every morning, seek ye first. Ain't that what Isaiah said? Seek ye first. Not second, third, or fourth. Not after two or three cups of coffee, big breakfast, or reading the newspaper, this and that and the other. Mm. God, wants to, God wants to come first. You ought to try it if you ain't. You ought to see how good it works. I'm 85 years old. It works good for me. It works better now than it used to because used to I didn't do that. But you know why it's older I got? The wiser I got. Yeah. In the Word of God. 
I began to read it, not just read it, but I began to study it and analyze it and say, God, just what does this mean? Huh? If we had a, we've got a direct connection with God through the Spirit of God. And He is our, He is the, the, uh, I guess you'd call it, he's the, the what, what is it they call like somebody that takes care of your estate? Huh? Executor, yeah. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is like an executor. God has a will. Do you know that? God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And the Holy Spirit is the executor. Whenever it comes to pass, you know how it's going to come to pass? From God, through Christ. Or does it fit in? The Bible said he's our perpetuation. He is our advocate. You know what that means? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and when you pray in the, uh, to God, the Spirit will, will holograph it to God, to, to, to Jesus, and Jesus can look over to the Father and say, Father, would you give this or that? Would you give him this or give him that? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. You go through Jesus. That's what the Bible said. If we ask anything of God in Jesus' name, he'll do it. If we believe in our heart and doubt not. Huh? Some people say, oh, well, I pray, but nothing ever happens. How do you know it don't happen? If you, you, God ain't, ain't does not one that, that demonstrates everything he does like he was a, 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 an athlete or, or a, a movie star. He does it where that nobody knows unless you're in touch with God. Lord, have mercy. I didn't know all that was in this lesson. Did you? Mm. How to stay in touch with God? Through communication. <laughs> you, if, you're, if you or your wife or one of your kids was deathly sick and needed to get to the doctor, what do you do? Grab that telephone, dial 911. Send the ambulance. That's the fastest way. Send an ambulance. Pick them up. They need to go to the hospital. They're about to die. That ambulance don't just know you that you need him unless he's summonsed. We say, well, I love God. Boy, I love anything else. Do you live like that? Do you pray like that? Huh? <laughs> I, I don't know, but I believe my time's up. <laughs> I've, I've, I've still got a long ways to go, but I'm like the preacher. I'm not going to bring it on all this time as a preacher's time either. Thank you for putting up with me again this morning. And may God, may God bless you. You may be dismissed.